debrief of this one. So a series of poll questions, and I won't give you very long on any of them. All right, here we go. So first of all, uh, which galaxy type did you think looked the most blue? And I see the most votes for the spirals followed by the irregulars. Nobody is choosing the ellipticals. That's what I had in mind too. So looking at all those images, we can very clearly see the blue color of spiral. And in that gallery, all of the irregular galaxies were also quite blue compared to the ellipticals. Okay, um, so why are elliptical galaxies so much redder? Is it because they contain old blue stars, young blue stars, old red stars, young red stars? or all kinds of colors. And I see 100% of votes for C that the ellipticals are redder because they contain many old red stars. That's exactly right. So they used to contain all kinds of stars, but then what happened? So galaxies start out with a mix of low mass and high mass stars. They're no more likely to form high mass blue stars as low mass red stars, um, but what happens over time? All right, so I see most votes for C, that if a galaxy starts out with kind of an equal distribution of blue and red stars, um, over time they'll become redder because the blue stars just happen to be a lower lifetime type of star. Those high mass stars burn through their fuel really quickly and so they die out quickly. And as a result, the stars that remain are mostly red. Um, it is true that newborn stars could be more blue because they could be higher mass stars. Um, that's what tells us that they're young is they just haven't had time to die yet, basically. Um, but that is definitely restricted to certain areas in certain galaxies, right? So overall, on average, a galaxy will become redder over time. All right, so um, a couple other galaxy properties I want to point out that probably wasn't apparent in the slides, but that's okay, um, is that they have very different uh, masses, right? So how do we measure those masses? Well, we already know that we use rotation curves, the um, measuring rotation velocity and the distance from galactic center for individual stars, and then applying Kepler's third law that gives us the mass of galaxies like our Milky Way. So spiral galaxies, we can measure their rotation curves and using these, we can get their masses. Um, for, spot, or for elliptical galaxies, it's a little bit more difficult. And why is that? What is the stellar motion like in elliptical galaxies. Yep, so I'm seeing most votes for E, that in elliptical galaxies, those stars tend to orbit in randomly oriented elliptical orbits. And so for that reason, it's difficult to apply this exact same um, rotation curve idea that we use to calculate the mass of spirals. So instead we have to um, use a slightly different technique, but it's based on essentially the same idea. It's based on actually a uh, Doppler shift. So this is more of a review question, but I'll ask it anyway. Looking at this galaxy, it's mapped in 21 centimeter radiation and the blue shift and red shift are plotted based on color. So what's happening to the top of this galaxy? All right, I see most votes for B that it is moving toward Earth. That's exactly right, it's blue shifting. So um, the wavelength is getting shorter as the top of the galaxy approaches us. The bottom is moving away, so it's rotating. And so if the top of the galaxy is moving toward the Earth and we measure the spectrum of this galaxy, then we're gonna see a spectrum that looks like this, where all of the lines, these dark lines here, absorption lines are blue shifted with respect to where they would be in the laboratory. So for example, if we measure the spectrum of hydrogen in this galaxy, then the whole spectrum will be shifted toward the blue at the top of the galaxy. But the spectrum that we measure at the bottom of the galaxy, since that part is moving away from us, is going to be slightly redshifted. And if we look at the entire galaxy and measure all of the light that comes from it, we're going to see both of these added together. So we're going to see both a blue shift and a red shift from this galaxy at the same time. But even more than that, um, the galaxy is moving fastest near the edges, slowest near the middle. And so we'll see a bunch of different Doppler shifts added up together, and those will result in this broadened Doppler line. So this is an effect we call Doppler broadening. We're just looking at lots of little Doppler shifts added together. And by figuring out the range of speeds from this Doppler broadened line, then we can calculate the mass of an elliptical galaxy. So this is the essential technique um, for measuring elliptical galaxies is measuring their Doppler broadening 
taking their range of rotation speeds. And then again, based on the size of the galaxy and the rotation speeds of the fastest stars, we can find the total mass of the elliptical. All right. So um, there's one other property of galaxies that is fairly useful for uh, grouping them. So this is called the mass to light ratio. And this can be a little bit difficult to reason through, uh, but basically it's just the mass of a galaxy divided by its total luminosity in units of solar mass and uh, the luminosity of the sun. So the mass to light ratio for sun-like stars is equal to one, right, by definition. And so if you had a galaxy with only stars like our sun, then it would have a mass to light ratio of one. Um, but if it happens to have a lot of low mass red stars, then they tend to add more mass without adding much light because they're so small and dim. Um, and so their mass to light ratio ends up being larger than one. And high mass stars have the opposite effect. They add a lot of light without adding quite as much mass in proportion. And so basically we have this scale where we have low mass stars, higher ratio, low, high mass stars, lower ratio. So I'll give you a little bit of time for this poll um, so you can apply this idea. Would the mass to light ratio be larger for spiral, elliptical, or irregular based on what you know about their typical colors? Remember our low mass stars are red, our high mass stars are blue. So at this point, I'm seeing the most votes for elliptical galaxies having the larger mass to light ratio. Um, and this is exactly what I had in mind. So low mass stars are more red. That gives us a higher mass to light ratio. Elliptical galaxies have lots of low mass red stars. And so they should have the higher mass to light ratio. So you can see that the mass to light ratio is another tool that we have for um, having a, uh, I guess, a quantitative metric for average star age in a galaxy. OK, so here is a big table of data about spirals, ellipticals versus irregulars. This is in your book. And I just want to call your attention to the mass to light ratio in the visible part of the galaxy for these. Um, for spirals and irregulars, they're both in the 2 to 10 or 1 to 10 range. So that indicates that they have more blue stars in those galaxies, whereas ellipticals have a mass to light ratio in the visible part of their um, of their galaxy to of 10 to 20. So they have more red stars. All right, so this is just a, another way to quantify that color metric if we don't have an accurate measure on the color metric, which um, could be difficult. Um, I also want to point out that if you look at not just only the visible matter contained within the galaxies, but all of the dark matter as well, then the mass to light ratio shoots up. And so this dark matter um, increases the mass to light ratio. And we don't really have a good idea of the total mass of irregular galaxies. Um, neither of the methods that I mentioned work particularly well for irregulars because they don't have even as organized of orbits as ellipticals. So we can see that the dark matter is going to really boost this uh, mass to light ratio and that can help us see um, how much dark matter is in all of these galaxies by comparing these two. All right, so my main point with the mass to light ratio is that we can use their typical values in the visible parts of galaxies to show that ellipticals mostly contain older stars and that dark matter can increase that mass to light ratio. But for our purposes right now, um, notice that ellipticals contain mostly older stars. And we're going to use this fact to speculate on galaxy formation for ellipticals. So the formation model that we talked about was really tidy for explaining the uh, you know, structure and colors in the Milky Way, but it didn't really account for the possibility of interactions with other galaxies. So back to this idea of tidal interactions, that's one sort of small interaction that could occur, but wholesale collisions are also totally possible. And remember back to the Doppler shift lab, we calculated that Andromeda is approaching the Milky Way. And actually in around three to four billion years, uh, Andromeda and Milky Way will collide. And so during this process, um, this simulation kind of illustrates what will happen 
So in about three and three quarter billion years from now, we'll see both disks of, of both galaxies approach each other in our sky. So our Milky Way and then Andromeda here. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, much of the dust and gas in those galaxies will collide and the high density caused by that gas collision, kind of just like the spiral density waves, will produce waves of star formation. So we'll see these bursts of star formation in the sky that continue as the galaxy, uh, as the two move through each other. Um, so in these two images here, um, think about what are the giveaways for star formation being triggered here? What would, how would we observe and know that there's active star formation? You can type it into the chat if you want. This is kind of a review question. Yeah, we're seeing a bunch of bright red nebulae, emission nebulae that are illuminated from young stars. We also see lots of blue stars um, forming in some of these regions of high density, definitely. All right, so after that, um, it will take billions more years, but eventually the two cores of those galaxies here and here after about 5 billion years, um, they likely make several passes through each other as they gravitationally pull. Um, they, they kind of move through each other, slow down due to the gravitational force, then come back together. So it's a, a multi-step interaction process. And about 7 billion years after that, um, the cores of those galaxies will have merged. All of the stars contained within each of them will now be orbiting the new galactic center and they very likely form a large elliptical galaxy. So we think that this is the primary way that giant elliptical galaxies form is by the mergers of large spirals. Um, you'll also notice when we looked at the um, gallery of ellipticals, those have deformed shapes. And it's possible that those deformed shapes are due to uh, the gravitational interactions from other galaxies, possibly old collisions, um, and maybe um, you know, gravitational ripples caused by other passing massive galaxies. So this interaction process is going to come up again as we talk about galaxy evolution. And that's kind of the, the point I'm trying to make is that galaxy formation isn't something that's necessarily one and done, um, but it's an ongoing process of formation and evolution. So we just talked about galaxies colliding and how the dust and gas collides, but what happens to the stars? All right, I see the most votes for A, but stars actually rarely collide with each other because the distance between them is so much bigger than their typical size. Um, but I wanna kind of point out, um, this kind of imagined simulation has us at the same distance from galactic center during the entire collision process. That's probably not the case, right? The orbits of the galaxies will likely be perturbed because there's so much more mass that's gonna cause uh, you know, gravitational differences from what we had before. So our orbit will probably change around galactic center, but it's not necessarily true that we're, that the sun or the solar system will collide with any other stars.